Chapter 8 In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will, and became great. Nabondius, Belshazzar's father, wrested Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar's son, Evil Merodach. Historical sources posit that some time afterward, Nabondius went into self-imposed exile in Arabia. His son, Belshazzar, was the vassal king of Babylon. Daniel chapter 8, circa 538 BC, Belshazzar's third year as vassal king, Daniel got a vision in Sushan, a province of Elam, southwest Iran. At the river Ulai, currently known as the Karun River, Daniel sees a ram, moving westward, northward and southward, and nothing could stand in its way. The ram has two horns, one came up last and it was bigger than the first horn. Verse 20, This ram is Media and Persia. Cyrus the Great of Persia, the bigger horn, defeated Astyages the Mede, the first and smaller horn, and annexed the two kingdoms, the Medo persian Empire. Verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Verse 6, And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. Verse 7, And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. In verse 5, Daniel sees a male goat with a large horn between his eyes. Verse 21, This is the kingdom of Greece and the horn is Alexander the Great. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great defeats Darius III and conquers the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The male goat, Greece, beats the ram, Meadow Persia, to a pulp and takes over its domain. Verse 8, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Alexander the Great, the notable horn, conquered the then known world, but, being bored, at age 32, he drinks himself to death on June 11, 323 BC. After his death, Alexander's kingdom was be divided among four of his chief generals. Lysimachus took Asia Minor, that is Turkey. Cassander took Greece and the neighboring countries. Seleucus took Syria and Babylon. And, Ptolemy took Egypt. Verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Verse 10, And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12, And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and prospered. Verse 9 states that a little horn came up out of one of the four horns. In 130 BC, pagan Rome conquers Macedonia in the Battle of Pydna. Macedonia was previously held by Cassander, one of Alexander's four generals. Rome swept southward, conquering Egypt. Out of pagan Rome arose a little horn, Papal Rome. 
This is the little horn that Daniel saw in chapter 7, verse 8. Verse 10, Papal Rome will speak blasphemies and stand against the Prince of the Host, Jesus, the Son of God. It is the Antichrist, the Son of Perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. His office will also oppress God's people. Verse 11, states that by him, the papacy, the daily sacrifice is taken. In most Bibles, the word sacrifice is italicized. It is supplied by the translators. The word daily, tormed, in the Hebrew, means that which was continual or regular. The little horn, ends, or takes away, that which was regular. But what did he take away? Pagan Rome. Paganism was the norm throughout Rome's long history. It was Satan's chief means of opposition to the work of God on earth. The text outlines a shift in demonic tactic. A little horn power would arrive that would change the standard, daily, regular form of opposition. The little horn, identified in Daniel 7 as the papacy, removes the daily, or regular, pagan form. Papal Rome replaces pagan Rome. Verse 13, the same Hebrew word for daily, tormid, is used. A saint asks the other, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. That is, the saint asks, how long shall they continue to oppress God's people and blaspheme heaven? The word translated as saint is from the Hebrew word, kordosh, it also means angel. The question is asked for Daniel's benefit. For verse 14 begins with the phrase, And he said unto me, Daniel. That is, the angel did not speak to the angel that asked the question. The answer is given in verse 14, Unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary will be cleansed in 2300 days, the 2300 day prophecy. We need to define the necessary parameters. Numbers 14 verse 34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6, the Lord states that when reckoning time prophecy, we use the day-year principle. The Lord told Ezekiel, I have appointed thee a day for a year. That is, a prophetic day is a literal year. Context. Abraham was called the friend of God. The Lord told him to go to an unknown land, and there, the Lord promised to make of Abraham, a great nation, Genesis 12. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Esau and Jacob. Jacob, whom the Lord renamed Israel, had twelve sons, these sons' descendants became the Israelites. It was the Lord's intention, as outlined in Exodus 19 verses 6, to make Israel a kingdom of priests. Israel was entrusted with the oracles of the plan of salvation, they were called to evangelize the world. But alas, they failed. Israel slipped into idolatry and bigotry, deserted the God of their fathers and were eventually captured by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Jeremiah prophesied that they would remain in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. In chapter 8, verse 1, Daniel was now an old man. In the third year of Belshazzar's reign, he sees a conflict between a ram and a goat with a large horn. Verse 13, the saint pinpoints a 2300 day or 2300 literal year prophecy, in which, the sanctuary would be cleansed. But what sanctuary? Firstly, there was no sanctuary in Babylon. In this verse, the word sanctuary is translated from the Hebrew word, kodesh. It means most holy or dwelling place of the Most High. In this context, the sanctuary cannot be earthly. 
1 Kings 8 verses 30, 39 and 43, Solomon's Prayer, consider the phrase, Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 30, Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive. Psalms 11 verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 34, The words of Christ, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. The sanctuary, Kodesh, the dwelling place of the Most High is in heaven. For further consideration, the sanctuary cannot be the earth as the earth is neither holy nor sacred. It is a sint mart, quarantine planet. Recall, the Millerites misinterpreted the text in 1844. They thought the sanctuary was the earth and were supremely disappointed when Christ did not return. Hebrews 8 verse 2, the true tabernacle is pitched by the Lord, not man. This locates the sanctuary in heaven. Let's find a starting point for this time prophecy. We cannot use the date Daniel got the vision, 538 BC, as that timeline misses out on key dates, especially the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45 verse 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. Isaiah wrote this text in the 8th century BC, in 559 BC Cyrus begun his ascendancy. Note. The Lord calls Cyrus by name over 150 years before he was born, and gave him the kingdoms of the earth. Ezra chapter 1, verse 2, Cyrus the Great, king of Persia, Iran, issues a command to build God's temple in Jerusalem. Cyrus began outfitting the Jews with gold and other materials to get the work done. In Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 to 27, Cyrus is now dead. Artaxerxes the new king of Persia notices Nehemiah's sadness and desired to look into it. To which, Nehemiah stated that his sadness is rooted in the destruction of Jerusalem. In autumn 457 BC, Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the charge to execute Cyrus' decree to rebuild Jerusalem. This date, autumn 457 BC, is the jump-off point for the 2300-day prophecy. With this starting point, there is perfect harmony in the application of all the events foretold in the explanation of that 490-day prophecy in Daniel 9 verse 25-27. Specifically, verse 25, Now therefore and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. We have stated previously that in autumn 457 BC Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the charge to rebuild Jerusalem. Thus, 457 BC is the starting point of the 2300-day prophecy. Daniel 9, the prophet read Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy. That prophecy is at its end, and the Jews were still held in Babylonian captivity. Knowing the conditional nature of God's promise to lift Babylon's yoke, Daniel began confessing the sins of his people. Immediately, the Lord sent Gabriel, flying light years faster than the speed of light, with a startling message. Verse 24, the angel says, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That is, for seventy weeks or four hundred ninety days, or four hundred ninety literal years, the gospel would be preached only to the Jews. Using the start date of 457 BC, this time period would end in 34 AD. Verse 25. There would be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks, that is, a 69-week period, 483 literal years, until Messiah the Prince. In AD 27, John baptized Jesus, Messiah the Prince, 483 years into the 2300-day prophecy. Verse 26, after the 62nd week, in the middle of the next week, the midpoint of the next literal seven years, the Messiah will be cut off, crucified. In AD 31, Jesus was crucified. Verse 27 states that the covenant would be confirmed. Recall, at his crucifixion, Jesus told his father, it is finished. The Jews would subsequently seal their own fate. AD 34, Acts 7 verse 59, Stephen is stoned. Herein, Israel as a nation sealed its rejection of Christ. The persecuted disciples and the apostles began to preach to the Gentiles. 490 years of the 2300 years have ended, and 1810 years remain. From AD 34, 1810 years extend to 1844. Then, said the angel, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 
From the stoning of Stephen, there are 1810 years left for the sanctuary to be cleansed. We revisit Daniel 8 verse 14. Recall, using autumn 457 BC as the start, the end point of the 2300 year prophecy is 1844.1844 marks the beginning of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. A quick synopsis of a ceremonial practice sheds light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. In the type, on the Day of Atonement, two goats are chosen. Lots are cast and one goat is chosen for the Lord. The cumulative sins of the people are symbolically transferred to the Lord's goat. The high priest, for example, Aaron kills the goat selected to belong to the Lord. Its blood was sprinkled in the most holy compartment of the sanctuary. The high priest would lay his hand on the head other goat, the scapegoat, Azazel, the devil's goat. He symbolically transfers the sins of the people to the scapegoat. This act is a symbol of the cleansing of the temple and the sins that accumulated there. The scapegoat was led to the wilderness by a fit man, where it was left to die. This is the type, typology. The ceremonial law was given by Christ. Even after it was no longer to be observed, Paul, for example in Hebrews 8 and 9, presented it before the Jews in its true position and value, showing its place in the plan of redemption and its relation to the work of Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. In the antitype, Christ, our high priest, cleanses the heavenly sanctuary. When we confess our sins, the Father forgives us because Christ has applied his blood to our account. The sins remain in the sanctuary, the book of records. But they don't belong there. They need to be expunged and laid on the scapegoat, the broad shoulders of Lucifer, Lux Pharaohs, the devil, the serpent, the dragon. Recall, Matthew 25 verse 41, Jesus says that hellfire was prepared for the devil and his angels. We choose to join the devil there when we refuse to give up our sins. Revelation 14's first angel shouts, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. 1 Peter 4 verse 17, Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Daniel 7 verse 13, Jesus goes to the Ancient of Days, with the clouds of heaven. The bridegroom cometh, as typified in the parable of the ten virgins, but not to the earth as the 1844 Millerites expected, but to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. Daniel 7 verse 14 dovetails into John's vision of the first angel's message, Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7, in that, Christ receives worship from all flesh. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary begun in 1844, judgment is afoot. Matthew 16 verse 27, when Christ returns, his reward is with him. This presupposes a judgment phase that determines what the reward will be. John 5 verse 22, The Father judgeth no man but has committed all judgment unto his Son. Christ is the judge. Isaiah 33 verse 22, There is one judge and one lawgiver. Jesus is the lawgiver, Jesus is the judge. 1 Peter 4 verse 17, Christ judges us first. As a matter of fact, all who ever lived on this earth, who claim to belong to Christ, are investigated. Our fitness for eternal life is being determined. After which, the Father blots out the sins of the righteousness and our confessed sins are being placed on the devil and his angels, where it rightfully belongs. In Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus gives insight into this investigative process, the cleansing of the sanctuary. In the parable, the king throws out folk that didn't have the proper wedding garment, verse 11. This is the crux of the events after 1844. Before anyone can join the wedding feast of the Lamb, the guest must wear the proper wedding attire, they must have robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7 verse 14. They must have shown they love Jesus. John 15 10, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Hence, there must of necessity be an inspection, an investigation, an investigative judgment. Who is worthy? Who has given his life completely to Jesus and is deemed worthy to stand? Revelation 22 verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. When the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then, and not till then, probation will close, and the door of mercy will be shut forever. Jesus stops interceding before the Father on the behalf of the sinner. The Holy Spirit withdraws from the earth. Revelation 22 verse 11, God issues the command, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, 
and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Verse 12, Jesus says, And, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Beloved, the 2300 day prophecy is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. There are no more time prophecies to be fulfilled, we are living on borrowed time. Hebrews 3 verse 15, Today if you hear the Holy Spirit's voice harden not your heart. The Lord is at this moment postponing his coming. The postponement is not indefinite, as Daniel says, Michael the Archangel will stand up. And when he does, the doors of probation, at this time kept ajar on the hinges of mercy, will be shut. And for those who choose to be lost, it'd be eternally too late. The Father gave us his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, God the Son, as a substitute for our sins. After Jesus' resurrection, the Father gave us, Jesus' substitute, vice-regent, vicar, the third person of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit. Today, he draws hearts, young and old, male and female to the cross of Christ. God is love and wants to save us. Let's determine to be saved.